last section. In the last, in the, uh, the last section we're talking about, he, talks, he says that the passions were the cause of the first language. And he, he does this by relying on this, this difference, again, um, between gestures related to needs and passions um, that are, are, are related to, um, what, I guess, uh, emotions, um, but then especially, yeah, especially love and, uh, and hate and pity and anger, right? Um, so the claim is that um, it was not need that created language, but passion. Right, so, and that you know, recall he, he was saying that we don't need language in order to fulfill our, fulfill our needs. And in fact, he's got this argument that in the beginning, when humans didn't have language, their needs actually forced them to separate, to, to, to move to all different parts of the earth in order to fulfill their needs, where um, passion had this um, other effect, which is to bring people together in society. Right? And so passion is the way in, um, is, is what brings people together um, that in a way that kind of uh, contradicts the way in which needs separate them. Right? And um, again, he's depending upon, you know, in this reasoning that, that humans are able to fulfill their needs without language um, and that it's only when they you know, when they want to express their emotions, that then they need language, and, uh, and that language is essential for this thing, of, of, for, for bringing t people together in society, right? He's got this evidence, um, and again, his evidence is always um, kind of these thought experiments, right? He says, one doesn't need words to find fruit or to hunt down your prey, but one does need accents, cries, and lamentations in order to move a young heart uh, or to point out injustice, right? Um, so, so that's the, the first part of this next argument. And then the second part <coughs> is um, this idea that because of this link of passions to the beginning of human language, it's actually the figurative use of language that precedes the literal use of language, right? And this is, a, this is an argument that we would call from Warburton, right? Uh, about you know figures of speech being at the origin of language, right? Um, so he said, you know, Rousseau here says figures, um, figure of language was the first to be born. Proper meaning was discovered last. The reasoning is that, if, and he says, a figure does not have to transpose words, but can transpose ideas, right? The initial figure transposed an experience of fear into a word, right? And so the key move is this transposition, which a figure has to carry out. A figure. Right? It's, it's always a kind of a metaphorical thing, right? So it's, it's taking two things that don't belong together and linking them together. So there's a, a transposition of, of, of A to B, right? Um, and, um, and he's saying that he gives us this example of the giant. So I, I don't have time to kind of go through it very carefully, but what we, what we have is that this, you know, the, the, when, when a man first sees another man, he's, he's frightened. He says, oh, who is this? I don't know who this guy is. He's going dangerous, must be a giant, right? Must be something, you know, scary and, and big, right? Um, and that's where the word giant comes from. <laughs> that's what he says. And then later on, you know, he kind of realized, oh, this is just another human. Uh, I don't have to call him a giant. I can call him um, just a human, right? And it doesn't have to be a giant anymore. And so you, you, you start out with the figurative use and you move to the, to the literal use, right? And so he says that's how the figurative word is born before the literal word when our, when our gaze is held in passionate fascination. So that passion uh, of fear is really, in a sense, that's what gives us that first figurative word. Um, and then later on, you know, we arrive at the sort of literal word. So what's interesting here, though, in his explanation of the warrant, really, for this, is that um, the illusory image presented by passion is the first to appear, that's what he says, and the language that corresponded to it was also the first invented. It subsequently became metaphorical when the enlightened spirit, recognizing its first ear, used the expressions only with those passions that had produced them. So you, you, you first use the word giant, and then later you switch to a different word that sort of has a, 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 a more... Uh, literal meaning, right? And so um, even though he's kind of using the same argument as Warburton, he's got a different warrant because if you recall for Warburton, 
there wasn't, a, a, there wasn't a sense in which you switched words, right? You still had the same, you, ha you had that same fable, you recall, and it just became, through habitual use, it became normalized. It became then conventional through that continual use, right? Um, whereas Rousseau is kind of indicating that there's a, there's a progression in which you first have this figurative meaning. That's what creates the, you know, the first words that are figurative, but then you switch you replace it with a literal word. And so in a sense, he's got a kind of Warburton's explanation for the first words, but then he's got Hobbes's explanation of sort of correct definitions for the later words, right? So he kind of is combining both Warburton's and Hobbes's explanations for how words developed, right? Um, and, and he's got this sort of two-step type of, of strategy for thinking through the origin of language, right? Um, so we're pretty much at the end, but if you have a quick question, I'm not sure. I, I kind of went through that last part a little fast. I'm sorry. Um, yeah? All right. Okay. Well, then keep reading the Rousseau for next time, and uh, I'll get back to this stuff next time. Thank you. <laughs>